on my side. No, it's not. Shh. It's the Film Flamers. Hey, everybody. I'm Robert. I'm Chris. And we're the Film Flamers. Today, we're excited to bring you one of the 90s copycat thrillers. <laughs> <laughs> That's not copycat. Uh, called Fallen. Yeah, this was the first watch for me, and we've been doing a whole slew of 90s crime, horror, and horror-adjacent movies, and um, I think this one is going to bring our little... What's the word I'm looking for? Bring our little... Theme? Yeah, theme to a close. Yeah. Right? We're going to put a moratorium on some 90s crime horror after this one, for at least for a month or two. Yeah, right? we've done Copycat and Silence of the Lambs, and now we're doing Fallen. And Seven. Seven. Yeah, yeah. so we, we've got a theme, and I think we've gone pretty much in order yeah. a little bit, except Silence of the Lambs, I would say, would, would have gone first before Copycat, obviously. Right, and Seven. I mean, so Silence of the Lambs sort of started it all in 1991, and Fallen is toward the end of the 90s, and 1998. So we've sort of come full circle, I feel. Yeah. So Fallen is a 1998 American supernatural detective thriller film directed by Gregory Hoblet and stars Denzel Washington, John Goodman, Donald Sutherland, Imbeth Davids, James Gandolfini, and Elias Codius. Uh, the music for the film was composed by Tan Dunn. Is that how you say his name? Right? I would say Tan Dunn. Yeah, I mean, Oscar winner, right, for uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. So there's some goodness there. Uh, the film tells the story of John Hobbs, the Philadelphia police detective who's investigating murders committed by an apparent copycat killer. The murderer is later revealed to be a fallen angel known as Azazel, who possesses human beings by touch. So an incredibly interesting premise to this yeah, it's an interesting thriller. twist to, you know, the things that came before it, that it's obviously trying to echo, like Silence of the Lambs and even Copycat and especially Seven, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it's an interesting twist on that kind of uh, kind of thing. But a lot of people were saying it was still a little derivative. But we'll get into a little bit of that later. Exactly. Because uh, there's a long line of detective horror involving Supernatural, right? So mm -hmm. Fallen's just, you know, another one and a pretty good example of that. So without further ado... This has fallen. Edgar Reese. Who's here? It's the brilliant detective who sealed my brutish fate. Remember this, Hobbs? What goes around really goes around. You have a safe trip, yeah? It's on my side. Go ahead! Light up my life! Criminals like Reese, they kill a few people somehow, it ain't their fault. But what took place tonight is the consequences of what I do. You're home early today. For a change. Detective John Hobbs wants to uncover the truth. What does Azazel mean? Now, my dictionary says that evil spirit of the wilderness... Walk away, Mr. Hobbs. But nothing in this world... Uh... Is on my side. Can help him solve this case. There are angels. Some of these angels were cast down, and a few of the fallen were punished by being deprived of form. Come on, get out of here. And each touch. And at the execution, did he try and touch you? Or... Yeah, he did, actually. Passes the soul of a killer into someone new. Well, I believe what I see, and I'm still trying to get my mind around what I just saw. Some things, pal, you shouldn't know. I know you, Hobbs. Put the gun down. I know who you are. Put the gun down! Mom is on my side. Hey, pal. My work is based upon evidence. And aren't your facts resistant to normal interpretation? Hey, Hobbs. You leave my family alone. But I'm still having fun. Denzel Washington. How do we fight him? Is it even possible? I believe it is. John Goodman. Josie, you know I didn't do this. I know it is, Hobbs. Donald Sutherland. I know you know more than you're saying. <laughs> Haven't you done enough, huh? Time is on my side. Fallen.
Philadelphia police detective John Hobbs, played by Denzel Washington, is fighting for his life. Running and eventually crawling through the snow in a remote location, he is dying. He, as the narrator, tells us that this is the story about how I almost died, but he needs to tell the story from the beginning. No, not the beginning. That would take forever. <laughs> so he'll start just a few days earlier. Philadelphia police detective John Hobbs, again played by Denzel Washington, visits serial killer Edgar Reese, played by Elias Codius, who he helped capture on death row. After some playful back and forth banter, Reese grabs Hobbs' hand and says something in an unknown language, later identified as a form of ancient Aramaic. Later, as he's executed in the gas chamber, Reese sings Time is on my side by the Rolling Stones. Time is on my side. Yes, it is. <laughs> In the following days, Hobbs and his partner Jonesy, played by John Goodman, investigate a string of murders by an apparent copycat killer of Reese. Hobbs, through hints given initially by Reese before his death, and later by the apparent copycat killer, tracks down a woman named Greta Milano, played by Embeth Davids. Greta explains that her father, a former detective, killed himself after being accused of a series of murders similar to the current ones. Hobbs goes to the Milano family's lake house in the mountains and finds books concerning demonic possession in the basement. He also discovers the name Azazel written on a wall. When Hobbs mentions the name to Greta, she gravely advises him to drop the case to protect his life and family. However, she reconsiders after a terrifying encounter with a man on the street who told her she knew too much and repeatedly tried to make physical contact. Greta explains to Hobbs that Azazel is a fallen angel with the power to possess human beings by touch. Hobbs realizes that Azazel, while possessing Edgar Reese, touched Hobbs before the execution but was not able to possess him. Greta explains that since the demon was unable to possess him, it will try to ruin his life by another way, and warns him of the inevitability of Azazel's victory. Later, Azazel finds Hobbs at his precinct and taunts him while jumping from body to body, singing time is on my side, and each body the demon passes through. Hobbs pursues the demon into the busy city streets, and counters that he knows of Azazel's true identity, to which the demon responds, some things, pal, you shouldn't know, and disappears into the crowds, body jumping to any number of innocent civilians. Later, to provoke Hobbs, Azazel possesses his nephew Sam and attacks John's intellectually disabled brother Art in their home. He flees into other people on the street, ending up in a school teacher. As the teacher, Azazel draws a gun and forces Hobbs to shoot his host in front of a group of bystanders. Azazel boasts to Hobbs that if his current host body is killed, he can transfer to any new host body in the surrounding area without even needing to touch them, that no one is able to resist him in his pure spiritual form. Lieutenant Stanton, played by Donald Sutherland, informs Hobbs that his fingerprints were found at one of the murder scenes, and along with the bizarre circumstances of the shooting of the teacher Azazel possessed, has become a suspect for all of the murders. To make matters worse, Azazel has inhabited several of the witnesses and gives false accounts that the shooting was unprovoked, throwing further suspicion on Hobbs. The following morning, Hobbs discovers that Azazel has broken into his apartment during the night and killed his brother in his sleep. As the police arrive, Hobbs barely escapes his apartment with his nephew Sam, who he takes to Greta's house in order to keep him safe. Greta explains that, if forced out of a host body, Azazel can only travel in spirit form for as long as one breath can sustain him. If he does not possess another host in time, he will die permanently. Forming a plan, Hobbs leaves Greta and Sam and travels to the Milano's mountain cabin and calls his partner Jonesy, knowing the call will be traced. Lieutenant Stanton and Jonesy show up to arrest Hobbs, however, Jonesy reveals himself to be possessed by Azazel and coldly executes Stanton in front of Hobbs. Azazel prepares to shoot himself, which will allow him to possess Hobbs, the only other person for miles. Hobbs attacks the Azazel-possessed Jonesy and in the struggle manages to shoot and mortally wound him. Confused as to why Hobbs would prevent him from killing his host but then purposefully giving him a mortal wound, Hobbs explains that he needed more time to poison himself, an act that will leave Azazel without a host. As Jonesy dies, Azazel takes possession of Hobbs' now poisoned body and frantically attempts to flee, but succumbs to the poison and dies. 
Detective Hobbs' voice returns as the narrator, reminding us that this is the story of how he almost died, revealing that the voice is, in fact, Azazel. A cat emerges from underneath the cabin and begins heading back to civilization. The end. Question mark. Ellipses. <laughs> uh, there's a lot going on in this movie. Yes. Fallen was released on January 16th, 1998, and grossed $25.2 million worldwide against its $46 million budget. It was released on 2,448 screens, and it opened at number three at the box office, making $10.4 million during its opening weekend alone. So it's safe to say that this was a box office bomb. Yes, it seems like it. Yeah, it made just over half of its budget back. And who knows how much of that was actually marketing mm-hmm. on top of that. So it was a pretty pretty large bomb. I think it's probably made all of that back in the ensuing years, just from you know video on demand and rentals and everything else. Because I believe that it is one of those movies that just exploded on rentals um, and direct TV and everything else. And, and it was well-watched and it's well-remembered. And it has somewhat of a cult following. It, I mean, it does. And I Because I, I worked in video stores in 1998, and I, I did not see this in the theater. And I, this was my first watch of this movie. And so it was easily at my fingertips all this time, but it was often checked out. I know that, you know, at Blockbuster, we got a whole wall of copies of it when it was first released, you know? So, I mean, there was anticipation for a video release and let's not discount cable, right? I think in the late nineties, a lot of people still had cable, um, you know, since there were no streaming services. And I think a lot of people caught it on things like HBO or Cinemax, whatever it played on. And I mean, this movie seems appropriate for some of those like long stretches of TBS afternoon movies and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who missed it initially have, have caught it now. Yeah, and that's how I saw it too. It was it was uh, I think it was on satellite TV, which at the time my family had, and I don't really remember any TV commercials or marketing or even it being in the theater. What I remember is the commercials for it on Direct TV, and so I was really into watching it, and I watched it several times back then, and I loved it. And I was just a teenager uh, back in 1998, uh, but to me, the twist was you know at the end was was really awesome and like it i didn't see it coming it was creepy the way the demon could move uh from place to place but part of the reason why i think that it didn't really succeed at the box office was of course it wasn't that much of a critical darling right yeah. on on rotten tomatoes it only has a 40 percent rating based on 57 reviews but it does have a much higher audience score of 72 percent the consensus reads has an interesting premise unfortunately it's just a recycling of old materials and not all that thrilling mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Variety wrote a review and said that Washington has the almost impossible task of holding together a convoluted picture that's only intermittently suspenseful and not very engaging emotionally or intellectually. And that is kind of a burn. Yeah. And Roger Ebert said, uh, well, he gave it a mixed review in writing. The idea is better than the execution. And by the end, the surprise has become too mechanical and inevitable. And there was another review that I saw from someone else that was like, time is not on its side or something. Yeah, I know. That was like the main quote of it. I was just like, okay, come on with your cleverness. But obviously, audiences liked it a whole lot better than the critics did and appreciated it more. And uh, I think we have more to say about that later as far as, you know, how it's actually, um, you know, viewed now versus then and its legacy. Um, You know, but it did it did win a couple or it was nominated for a couple of awards, right? Yeah, it was nominated for a Bram Stoker Award for Best Screenplay, and um, you know that's that's those awards are for writing. Um, the International Horror Guild nominated it for Best Movie that year. So okay, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. What did you feel about like the look and feel of this movie compared to like some of the others, like the tone and everything? Do you feel like this was a little bit more? To me, it seemed like it was a little bit more noir, right? Definitely. I mean, when I was watching it, I kept getting lots of noir beats and detective story beats from it, right? I mean, everything down to, you know, some things in the score and very much the narration of the movie. Like, they were really going for this Maltese Falcon kind of vibe to the movie. Seven does a little bit of that. And so I'm wondering if this wasn't, they actually did the same, like, bleach bypass kind of of situation with the film and everything to kind of make it uh, all the shadows increase, you know, the the blackness and the highlights actually increase in contrast Mm -hmm. without reducing any color. Um, So they tried to do that same kind of look and feel as, like, Seven, I think. And Seven was a little bit noir in a way. Uh, 
Uh, I'm wondering if they were just trying to kind of emulate that or if they really were trying to do their own kind of thing with noir. I think that they were really trying to harken back to some of those like 1940s movies more than they were trying to copy the success of Seven or even Copycat, you know, Um, because Fallen is its own movie. Yeah. I mean, and and obviously it's it's a possession film at the end of the day, right? It's certainly different enough from Silence of the Lambs or Seven, you know, or certainly Copycat, you know, but it has those similarities in some of those beats as well. Uh, But I would definitely say this is the most noir of all of them. I, I think so, too. And I think that in the long line of these, you know, 90s crime thrillers, if that's what we want to call them, these horror adjacent movies, um, they were sort of leading up to that point. I think that a lot of the earlier ones like Copycat, Seven, Sons of Lambs, even, you know, others that we haven't mentioned, ignored the noir aspect of it. Right. And so this really was, you know, they're trying to do its own thing. The yeah. thing that. I think about this movie that you made it do so poorly at the box office, not only had to do with, you know, critical response, but really, if we look at it, the 90s were filled with movies like this. Yeah. And by 1998, some people had to be experiencing some sort of fatigue, right? Yeah, I think modern modern audiences are like more forgiving of the similarity to other crime thrillers in the 90s since time has moved on because it's not coming out like literally next to them. Right. right? So every weekend there's not a new one at the box office for people to go see, right? We've had some time to stop and think and appreciate, you know, the the art of some of these movies and to look back and just, you know, see how incredibly popular they were with the audiences at large. Yeah, and I think uh, since you're not seeing that like associated with some of these other films, especially the ones that it came out next to, you know, it stands apart a, a lot more, especially because of the supernatural element that was attached to it right which to me like at least in the colloquial view of what horror is puts it a little bit less adjacent and more into the horror category and i have some to. of these others i completely agree because i i love the possession aspects of this movie i like possession movies you know everything from the exorcist to you know um Annabelle, even, yeah. right? And earlier you were actually mentioning to me before we started recording uh, how unique this film is as far as its take on possession. Right, because we don't get, you don't see a lot of possession movies where everything is done by touch. I thought that was incredible incredibly interesting and inventive yeah we only see possession through soul for the most part you yeah. know we never even see it you know as entering the body through an orifice or things like that they really just attack a person's soul and you know that's the what they have to deal with as far as their position goes but the the fact that this demon can jump from person to person just by brushing against them or touching them right is incredibly inventive and very scary to me yeah there was a city scene where the the demon's kind of trying to to chase someone and it's an interesting chase sequence because a lot of the time it wasn't it was the, the street was so crowded he couldn't just pick one person and run after you so he's literally just making each person go shoulder to shoulder hand to shoulder you know whatever he had to do to just like travel through the crowd at like lightning speed and i think the director actually got dancers to actually do that like that sequence oh, yeah. so that it was all choreographed to where it would look kind of incidental and accidental where they look like they were kind of falling into each other mm-hmm. and everything and it, and it worked really really well it looked really natural and, yeah. and really horrific scary it looked effortless you yeah know? i mean and that's to watch something chase you through people mm-hmm. is very inventive to see on on film and that's something that i really haven't seen anything like since or before and i really wanted to see more of that yeah. in the movie you know because i remember i do remember tv ads and and trailers for this you know when it came out and they really played that up in all those trailers, right? Mm. All the things passing and the people changing and talking to him, you know? And that they had that one great scene where that elderly couple is leaving the police station and they're taking turns back and forth and having that conversation with him. Yeah. And I was just like, this is what I want to see more of, you know? Like, sort of stop some of this, you know, side stories and plots. And let me just, I want to see more of this possession. I want to see more of the horror elements, right? So I think the movie sort of gets lost and doesn't know what it wants to be toward the end of it, right? Is it a, is it a new a crime thriller or is it a horror movie is it a possession movie yeah you know it's sort of trying to be a whole lot of things at one time and you know focus on on you know what what you're good at or what's good on screen you know i think it works well it kind of creates its own kind of amalgam without seeming like it's reaching too much my issue with the film i think is less that it was trying to be too many things but that it just didn't get the right 
I don't know, group together to get it done. Like you see that they did everything by the numbers. They they have a good script. They have a great concept. They have some really cool set pieces and moments yeah. in this film. And they've got a stacked cast. I mean, John Goodman yeah. is a national treasure. Amen. And I always see, <laughs> love seeing M. Beth Davids, of course, who has been in, you know, Army of Darkness and Schindler's List and 13 Ghosts, the whole paranoia, mm-hmm. Californication, Girl Mad Men, Ray Dawn. She's in everything. Like she's, she's uh, great. Girl I love with seeing tattoo. her. I'd like to see. Yeah, I'd like to see her more. But I think it's. I mean, they did the the, ble- the bleach bypass on the film. They got a good score going on. Uh, you know, everything's there. But I think the director was almost too paint by numbers, and so you have that all the ingredients there. But like what seven might have had with the the same like film look as far as the bleach bypass process for the film and everything but they had the set decorators to really give everything like a brown look uh to like the clothes and the the sets and everything else so everything the cinematography the film process the set decorator everything was kind of directed into a tone by David Fincher versus this director did not do that. He was a by the numbers and this is just my opinion, uh, direction of how each scene should go in and of itself. And I think with someone with more of a vision of what this film could have been, or if he had had a better team together or something, this film could have stand, stood apart even more and been its own thing. Because to me, this film almost looks more dated than seven does just because of its lack of stylistic, you know, stylistic flair, uh, even though it's three years newer or, or two years newer. I want to have to agree, too, because I think when Seven came out, people were sort of flabbergasted at the way it looked. It was kind of a new vision for film, right? Yeah. And you have to invent yourself in ways like that to keep things fresh. Um, everything on paper for this movie should have worked. Yes. Right? So, I mean, we talked about the cast itself. There's a lot of horror cred behind this cast, right? We have Denzel Washington, who's in things like The Bone Collector, right? Mm-hmm. And um, he doesn't really do a whole lot of like horrific movies or thrillers he does now at the time no but didn't we say when we were talking about seven that he he was up for the role yes. and right? i think that he took this because of his regret for not taking seven. exactly and mm-hmm. so i mean like you're trying to make up for something else but john goodman is a national treasure and he is a horror treasure as well like he's been in chud he has a little like a little cameo in chud in arachnophobia arachnophobia and he's also been in that one that he i thought he got some awards or award noms for what 10 cloverfield yeah mm-hmm. Ten cloverfield I, yeah Lane. i mean for sure some Saturn stuff Donald um, Sutherland is a huge horror name obviously yes my gosh things like Invasion of the Body Statures and Don't Look Now Buffy the Vampire Slayer for crying out loud we've already talked about M. Beth Davids Army of Darkness The Hole you know yeah. um, Elias Codius was in The Prophecy Apt Pupil Zodiac Fourth Kind Shutter Island I mean these people have a lot of horror behind them and yeah. if we're talking about a director that's doing thing by numbers we have to look back I think a little bit to his earlier work and uh, Gregory Hoblet got his star Art and television, namely procedurals, things like Hill Street Blues, NYPD Blue, LA Law, where these episodes of television are varied by the numbers week in and week out. And that's what he's used to doing. Mm-hmm. Um, prior to making Fallen, he directed a movie called Primal Fear, which I like very, very much. Yeah. It has Richard Gere and Edward Norton. And um, I mean, it's just another one of those crime movies. But instead of a detective, we have a lawyer, right? He also did a movie called Frequency, which my father likes very, very much, but I've never seen. Have you seen that? Yes. So he's talking to him through the radio or something like that. His dad, his dead dad. I think so. Yeah. So, I mean, like this director is probably used to doing things in a very quick, efficient manner, which is what you have to do when you're doing episodic television. Uh, the writer, Nicholas Kazan, um, has done things like At Close Range, Reversal of Fortune, Enough, you know, I think he even wrote Matilda. So, I mean, yep. he, he's got a lot of this thriller stuff, too. I mean, he had a good script and a very good idea. And you're you're exactly right. It just wasn't executed the way that it was supposed to. Yeah, and uh, there's so much. Been. Yeah, and there's so much gold to mine here. And I'd love to see to have seen or or still see a sequel or even a series based on this premise where this demon can just travel through people at will. You know, and basically any living creature. You know that can house his soul, so um, I thought it was well executed. Uh, that the twist works. I think most people don't see it coming, per se. Even though all the clues are there, it is exactly what's going to happen because you do see the demon becoming a cat yeah. earlier in the film. And that's what I thought. Well, the first thing I thought when I was watching that particular scene, I was like, look at that orange cat, and that guy's name is Jonesy. I was like, this guy alien all over it, yeah. right? 
And then the first thing I saw when that cat hit after I thought that, I was like, oh, shit, is he in the cat? I was like, can he do that? You know? And I mean, obviously, by the end of the movie, you see that he can, right? Yep. Um, Also watching this movie, I got really um, interested in whether or not Azazel was a real demon or fallen angel. Yeah, so certainly I, a real name, yeah. Yeah, I did a little research because I don't remember ever hearing him in the the Bible, you know, the Christian Bible. Um, and he's really not. They're men- it's mentioned a couple times and it's sort of like a right, the scapegoat right, right? And I... I I don't know what that's about, really. But uh, I did some further research, and it's pretty – he's a pretty big deal when it comes to, like, Judaism or, you know, Jewish mysticism, things like that. So he's mentioned a lot in something called the Book of Enoch, which is not part of the Torah. It's sort of like um, separate apocrypha, right? And I think it was part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so essentially he is – Satan's right-hand man on Earth, right? So he's one of the fallen angels sent to Earth, and he is ascribed in some of this, like, Jewish mysticism as being the person that brought all sin to humans. Like, it was his life's mission to create sin on Earth and to create the downfall of man. So they say that he, like, gave them the, you know, wherewithal to make weapons. So he created war. He gave women, um, you know, jewelry and makeup, you know, to create some sort of, like, lustful sin. And um, really, the Book of Enoch is about, you know, why God had to wipe the earth out with a flood. And all of it had to do with Azazel for the most part. Okay. So, but everything in this movie, all the really cool things about Azazel are completely fictitious, right? There is no sure. touch or possession, right? Yeah. And he doesn't like to sing, like they say in the movie, right? And so, I mean, like, I really wanted all those things to be true. I wanted well, to really, have taken this and, like... Yeah, they don't really say that he likes to sing. He just li- obviously likes to sing, just to, to really kind of mess with Hobbes, right? And what did you think of the use of that song? I thought it was actually really well done, and you had some some interesting like set pieces where it was used kind of creatively to show who the demon was in and to kind of taunt Hobbes, like especially in that precinct scene where it's jumping from police officer to police officer. I mean, these people, these are people that are supposed to be, you know, helping to protect each other and support each other. And there's this demon kind of floating through these people singing to him, you know, and just that's when he just goes after it and goes on the streets and you get some more wacky hijinks happen. But it, it was a really kind of um, haunting scene you know i mean i i, I agree I, I liked that i mean i liked that sort of gimmick of knowing where the you know the demon was at any particular time right because yeah. if quickly passing from person to person it's hard to keep track of who he's in and who he's not and i really appreciated the use of that song which i never thought to be a creepy song until watching this movie and it does get stuck in your head like really easily but i much prefer the use of that song to when the camera sort of pans up and over people and you see like this weird distorted image that would like POV the demon, right? Yeah. I got tired of that real quick. I'd rather hear the music, yeah. right? Uh huh. So it does show the point of view of the demon in that weird, like, different film way of doing. And I'm, I'll describe a little bit of that later when I go into my fun facts. Oh. But uh, honestly, uh, I think the the song was done really really well but they also used something else to kind of showcase a different way uh of showing like who the demon was in right mm-hmm. and one of the first scenes that they filmed with was with Elias um uh, Elias Codius mm-hmm. and the he the director loved the physicality that he gave to the demon and the personality he gave to the demon and the way he would smile he basically brought in all these different actors that were going to be possessed John Goodman and the the girl that was later and the older lady right. and all these people that were going to be um you know actors that actually spoke lines from the demon as extras in, in a way uh to study his performance and kind of show the way he moved and everything so that they would all kind of smile the same kind of shit eating grin and and everything else and that was done really really well in in uh, several cases i mean for the very few minutes that he's on screen in this movie right you're right he plays a much bigger part in it because those people mimic him so incredibly well yeah right and i mean when i was watching this i was like three minutes into the movie and i'm already texting chris and i was like elias codius is so good in this movie yeah which <laughs> is like mm-hmm. he's so briefly in it but he's so memorable and so great as that particular role didn't you have a personal experience involving that song recently um 
Yeah. <laughs> so I was just finishing up my notes. Um, you know, I was I was kind of a lull between meetings at work. Uh -huh. And so I was essentially writing my, my notes and the synopsis and everything for this for this film. So, you know, in preparation to record. And so as I'm leaving the building, I'm going down because it's it's hot as outside, you know, in Texas right now. It's like a hundred and 10,000 degrees. And it'll be 100 degrees well into December. Yeah, essentially. <laughs> so I'm taking the basement route to the parking garage, and which is air-conditioned by, like, the daycare and stuff. And so I'm walking. It's all echoey and, you know, uh, creepy mm -hmm. it is down there. And I hear someone coming behind me, which is, like, normal. Uh, you know, they're, coming, they're, they're walking behind me. I'm also probably on their way to the parking garage. But what do they start singing behind me? <laughs> but this... <laughs> Fucking song. <laughs> Time is on my side. Yes, it is. I did not even look behind me. I was more concerned with the mess I was about to make in my pants. Because <laughs> yeah. I totally would have shat myself right then. I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, I just noped right on out of there. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, did this really actually happen? Like, I've never heard anyone sing that. Like, <laughs> how is this happening right after I watch this movie and right after I write those notes? And I just, just it just made me think of how terrifying that must have been for like if this you know if the people actually in this movie actually existed how terrible and uh horrifying this would be in reality to know that you're being followed and not know who it is that could be anyone including someone you love and know or even yourself and how fast that can travel and what it could possibly do with absolutely no qualms of of you know, getting killed or getting caught or anything else. That's terrifying. And I oftentimes think of horror movies in that particular lens. Like I try to to look at the the hyper realism of it, right? Like if this were actually happening in real life. And that's why I get so terrified so easily I'm watching movies. So I can put myself in these people's shoes really quickly. Yeah. And so if someone were in a garage doing that, I would have just freaked the hell out. I know for sure. But um the use of this song to, you know, finish talking about it is completely effective because I think when people mention Fallen to one another, the first thing they do is sing those two lines of that song, right? It's mm -hmm. what everyone remembers above everything else. It's completely effective. So another song that they used in this film, besides obviously Time is on My Side, is Sympathy for the Devil by the Rolling Stones, as used as the end credits. It was also used earlier in 1993, 93 or 94, for the end credits for Interview with a Vampire, but instead of Rolling Stones, it was Guns and Roses. Right. I think it makes sense in both films, and I think it's an effective ending for both films. I would have liked to see something different, but it does make sense for Fallen since they already are using that Rolling Stone song mm -hmm. to use, um, you know, uh, something for the devil. And it actually, it, lyrically, it makes like perfect sense for the movie, even more so than it did for Interview of the Vampire. And I, and, I, and I liked it a lot. I mean, I like that song quite a bit. I also like the Rolling Stones a lot, too. And so I know that they probably made a shit ton of money from this movie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so did Coca-Cola. Using... <laughs> oh, was there a lot of placement? I oh, didn't... my God. Yeah. <laughs> Well, they like they show, one of the scenes in the the, the 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 precinct actually shows like a opens with a vending machine dropping a diet coke, and someone grabbing it, and then they they're walking by later, and it shows them sitting right next to a coke machine, like just right between all the characters, and I'm like, holy shit! So obviously there was some placement here to pay for the film. Maybe that's what happened to New Coke. They couldn't pay for it after this movie. <laughs> I usually can spot product placement in movies fairly quickly, too. I don't. Maybe I was just too wrapped up in that demon going from person to person by touch that I didn't pay attention. Yeah. And speaking of the music in this film, uh, the, the music by Tan Doon, like, I, I didn't really pay attention to the credits before I watched this. But what was interesting was, like, I, I started listening to the music during the film and kind of noticing it. Mm -hmm. I was like, this sounds a lot like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I'm like, huh, whatever. I guess Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon must have, like, taken some riffs from this. And then only later to discover, oh, it's the same composer, and he used some of the same themes from Fallen, you know, and, and worked it into Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and then won a bunch of awards. So I didn't know the origins of the Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon score that just won a huge amount of, like, nominations nations and awards for that score actually had some of its origins within you know for the fallen score which is i just i never knew that so it was interesting i didn't know that either i mean i know that he was also nominated for an oscar that year because he wrote one of the original songs from that movie as well from crouching tiger oh yeah yeah so that was like i think three years later in like 2001 or something when crouching tiger came out mm -hmm. uh so it wasn't that that far away but there was some of the same kind of instruments and motifs that were being played in fallen to a lesser extent 
but uh, and of course, like you said, they'd added some like saxophone and stuff to make it a little bit more noir. Yeah, and that's just interesting for kind of from an Asian perspective mm -hmm. with some of those instruments. And I thought that was a really interesting score for this film, in a way, because there's also some they do some uh, themes while the demons and that point of view or whatever, and they just like this almost tribal kind of music while he's doing that. Right. So there's a lot of different kind of pieces to the music in this film, which is really interesting. I'd love to hear it isolated and by itself. I haven't done that yet. Can you do that? The score? Yeah, I can listen to the soundtrack. Oh, and just watch the movie like silent? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, just, I literally mean just listen to the score. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about like creating some sort of experience, like try to sync it up Dark Side of the Moon style or something. <laughs> You're like, you can do that? I'm like, yeah, I, I can like, listen to the score. Like, what are you are talking watching about? movies like this more often? God. Well, it's already synced to the film. <laughs> you're right. I know. That just sounded completely stupid. So, no, I, I get what you're saying. Like, watch it with the score, but without the actual like dialogue. dialogue and everything else. Yes. No, I don't think you can do that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so I did notice a lot of those, those jazzy moments to it, and they were really trying to like hammer that noir feeling home with that, I think. I'm not sure. Because to me, it sounded a little out of place, right? Or it didn't sound right with the, the rest of the score. And it was noticeable to me. And I'm not usually someone who notices a lot of film scores, right? So if I pick yeah. something out, it's you know, right there. And I was just like, at some point, I was just like, okay, we get it. You know, it's a detective story. You don't have to add all these extra elements in. You're doing a good enough job on your own right now. Just continue with the score as is. Yeah. But, so that demon vision footage in the film was shot using a film stock called, like, Ectochrome, which is actually normally developed for stills photography. Additionally, the scenes were all shot at six frames per second and then printed at 24 frames per second, hmm. meaning that each frame is exposed four times. Coupled with the camera movements, uh, the technique gave a blurred or streaky quality, and a mesmerizer lens was also used, which also allowed the camera operator to like cock the lens several degrees to the left or right. So to me, I don't like like a manufactured, almost slow motion look and feel with like stop motion-y kind of stuff. I've always hated that in film. I think it takes you out of it. If they were going to do this, I would have much rather them have used, you know, full, you know, 30 frames per second, 24 frames per second, which is normal for a film. Right. Um, and to make it more filmic looking. And you can still add all that stuff, but you don't have to make that look like the person's like having a seizure and they're drunk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, because it, it did take me out of watching this movie. I, you know, when it, when it started happening a lot more often toward the middle of the movie when they were passing back and forth or when he was breaking into apartments and things like that. And I was just like, I don't, I don't need this. I don't like it. It doesn't look visually pleasing to me. And and it really was taking me out of the story. And like, I, I feel like it would have been almost more terrifying. Like if I had filmed this today, like I would have probably done, you know, the rack effect where you're zooming out, but moving the camera towards something right. or vice versa, where like the, 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 the person in view stays the same size, but the background is shifting like Jaws. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of like that. So that's, that's been done a lot. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a thing, but it's actually very effective, Agreed. but also putting kind of that red tent or you, whatever you want to it to almost do a rubber band effect. So you do, that to move back and then shoot forward as though the demon is like lightning going inside of you and i feel like that would be more terrifying and jolting to the audience to see that kind of effect of getting possessed just th that quickly that effortlessly that terrifyingly i think that would have been a little bit more you know uh jarring than showing this floating seizure like drunk thing that like seems like it doesn't really have an intelligence it's just kind of going into some rando you right know? and i mean because i don't i don't think the audience needs that you know we we know what's going on in the movie anyone paying attention will know that this demon is possessing people by touch we don't have to have some sort of otherworldly pov to to get what's going on right yeah i mean this is maybe just another way a bad directorial choice to you know, show something that we didn't need to see. It's like beating us over the head. You yeah. Know? Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see James Gandolfini in this. I did not know that he was in this movie before watching it. Yeah. And a, a sort of pre-Sopranos role, along with the actress who plays his sister yeah. on that show. It's basically it, sitting in the desk next to Ada him. Totoro. Yeah. I was just like, oh my God, it's like a Sopranos reunion. And I had to remind myself, no, this is before the Sopranos. Well, he and her would also be, I think, on like NYPD Blue or something in that same set because that director is just like the same set and location and same director and the same actors uh, essentially for that. So he 
he's used to doing those police procedurals, I guess. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a part of that. I know. Um, but yeah, but again, that's just another like by then. This director did everything that he was comfortable with, apparently. Yeah, so he's not like James Gandolfini. He's not uh, horror cred though. No, he's not. He, there's no horror in his you know filmography whatsoever. Yeah, so. but it was fun to see him nonetheless. Well, wasn't he in like the Mexican? And he did a good something? job. Yeah, I mean, for one of his earlier roles, I think he did a, a good job. Yeah. I mean, I was I was happy to see him. I'm I'm always happy to see him. The acting in this movie was good. So, so I have some fun facts. Yay! I love these. This is almost my favorite part of the episode. <laughs> so, uh, I'll start with a shorty. So, uh, the screenwriter Nicholas Kazan specifically wrote the role of Jonesy for John Goodman, and rightfully so. I think every screenwriter needs to write at least one screenplay with a role. Created for John Goodman. And he's a national treasure. I just, I was like, he's so good. He's so good in everything I see. I don't think he's won an Oscar yet. He he really needs to. I I mean, mean, it's time. Seriously. So this is one of two movies with Denzel Washington and John Goodman in which the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil, appears in this film and Flight from 2012 from Robert Zemeckis. Oh, that was a good movie. Both Gregory Hoblet and Robert Zemeckis have made successful time travel films like Frequency for you know, Hoblet, and uh-huh. Back to the Future, obviously, from Robert Zemeckis. Denzel Washington has also made a successful time travel movie called Deja Vu in 2006. Jesus. I did see that. It was good. I haven't seen that. Yeah. Actor Elias Codius also starred in the 1995 film The Prophecy, where he played a detective hunting down a fallen angel. So he's kind of the opposite, mm-hmm. you know. And I forgot there was a detective element to that movie. Yeah. I mean, there really is a lot of detective horror out there. I mean, things like, what, uh, Lord of Illusions, the Clive Barker thing with yeah. um, the guy from Quantum Leap, mm-hmm. that everyone thinks is so hot. And what I couldn't like, I, I watched these clips from the prophecy fairly recently, and I forgot that Vigo Mortensen, you know, Aragorn from Lord of the Rings, was back in prophecy with Christopher Walken. But Vigo Mortensen played the devil; he played Lucifer, and he was so creepy, more creepy than Christopher Walken was, and that's a feat. And I was just like, just keep forgetting how good of an actor Vigo Mortensen is. Well, because Christopher Walken's just creepy when he walks into a room; he doesn't really have to do anything. But it would have been better if it was John Goodman. (laughs) Yes, always. Always. better. (laughs) So the scene where the rafter collapses while Hobbs or Denzel Washington is in the basement of the cabin was not in the script and not in the original cut of the film. During test screenings, the scene played out with Hobbs simply looking around, finding the book, and leaving. However, at one particular screening during that scene, a member of the audience got up to go to the bathroom, and as he left the theater, the door made a huge bang, causing everyone in the theater to jump. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this prompted Warner Brothers executives to suggest that perhaps a sudden scare should be shot and inserted into the scene so as to enhance the tension even further. And actually, I jumped mm-hmm. at that scene. Like when too. the ceiling kind of collapses right there, you're like, holy shit, like what was that? You know, because he's just opening the book. And it was like a perfect because because he's like searching around for like a good five minutes in the film and it's all quiet. It's just a perfect time to do that kind of a jump scare. And it, it worked. I mean, I, I literally it affected me. I didn't roll my eyes or anything. It was just that effective. So it's funny that they kind of incidentally fell upon that realization from someone just slamming the door at a test screening. I thought test screenings great. are important. And an effective jump scare is really important, too. I mean, it's a staple in horror. And if you're going to make a good horror movie, it should at least have one good effective jump scare. Yeah. So my final fun fact is that there there's actually a fan-made cut of the film called Azazel, and it has an alternate ending in which Azazel does not win, and it also emits the uh, narrative voiceover. Oh, I, I kind of want to see that now. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see that. I tried to find it, and there's references to it, but I can't find it anywhere. I don't, I don't know that it's on YouTube or anything, but if I can find it, I'll put it in the show notes. And listeners, if you know where to find it, please send it to us so we can take a watch. Yeah, some of these edits of some of these movies, they're like the Phantom Menace uh, Star Wars movie. Mm-hmm. Someone did like the Phantom Silence, and so like no one talks <laughs> in it. <laughs> and it's actually like a better film. So. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, so there were no fun facts about who almost got these roles. I guess not. I mean, because I'm pretty sure that Denzel Washington like was like, "This is for me." Well, right? that's the problem with the stuff is that you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just missing from the history books yeah. because like we have so much stuff over these like 
uh, we have so much information and stories about these movies that just e- exploded because there was so much interest and the press wanted to know every little thing. So we know everything about like the casting for Fatal Attraction and for Silence of the Lambs right. and things like that. But people didn't really delve or ask these questions for Fallen and how it was made. And so we just don't know. And so I'm sure there's so many more stories. And I know of a few that I didn't mention. Um, you know, like uh, the producer, he said it was the, the the first day of shooting this film was the worst day of his entire career mm. because they were going to shoot the cabin scene and uh, like start doing the cabin scenes up in the mountains. And the truck with all the equipment ran into a tree. And so they were one day behind on the first day of filming. Jesus. And they lost some things. They <laughs> had a wreck, obviously. Like there was too much. There was so much rain, torrential rain and storms up there. Like they... They just couldn't see, and so the truck literally just ran into a tree. It was like the dark old house or whatever we just watched. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, this is, just doesn't exist because there wasn't enough interest at the time. So it'd just be really interesting to see, kind of a retrospective maybe from some of these actors and filmmakers to see what else there is to mine here. Because I'm sure there's really interesting uh, tidbits. I loved the 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 tidbit about uh, the you know test audience member slamming a door mm-hmm. and basically getting made into the film. Well, I didn't watch this on DVD, so I didn't see any extras or anything. I just you know I bought it on. Amazon streaming. And I would like to know what these actors think about it. You know, at the time, if it was not, you know, accepted well by critics, didn't make a lot of money, you would think it's something that they would just write off as part of their career, right? But if it's taken off and has more of a cult following now, I would like to see how they feel about their performances and things. Yeah, and part of the story of this film is the story of other films. Like, we were piecing together that we know Denzel Washington turned down uh, one of the roles in Seven Mm -hmm. and that he regretted it. So that two years later, that's probably why he accepted this role. It's an assumption on our part, but I think the, the pieces kind of fit together. Yeah, I completely can see that. I mean, it, it seems to me this is why he took this role. It was his redemption, you know, for that. And I mean, I like that sort of like Hollywood lore attached to it. Yeah. And this is why we like talking about fun facts and talking about horror movies or movies in general. So. And that's also why I think this cast was stacked. Yeah, yeah. You know, because they all wanted to do the another Silence of the Lambs or another Seven, you know, or something else. Uh, and that's why we got you know, John Goodman and Denzel Washington and um, James Gandolfini and M.F. Davids and John Goodman. And John Goodman, again. And Elias Codius. <laughs> God, we forgot about him, too. We just keep thinking about John Goodman. I like it when he sings at the end and he's, like, doing his best Mick, Mick Jagger impression. Like, he's so good and everything. Oh, and I love how when when Denzel kind of explains to him his plot, oh, it's like, I'm waiting for you to die because I needed more time to poison myself so that you would have nowhere to go. And then the demon, like, you have that cathartic moment with the demon because John Goodman is, is just goes, to scrunches up his face mm-hmm. and, and goes, motherfucker! You know, like, <laughs> like yeah, you, you got me, you know? And it's like this really cool cathartic moment, like, yes, we beat the guy, you know, th- this demon is different. Defeated. You know, little do we know the bad guy wins, but you know, so it goes. And I like that ending. And I and I think this this movie would have been worse if it hadn't had the bad guy ending. Yeah, because we don't get to see that very often, right? Bad guys hardly ever win. And it's it's always good to see that from time to time. And yeah. I, I have to wonder if other people appreciate John Goodman as much as we do. Or is he just one of those underrated actors that people discount all the time? I, keep, he, I think he keeps getting underrated, mainly probably because people are used to seeing him on, or they know of him at least from like Roseanne, right? Right, from it as a TV guy. But he's been in so many movies, and he's been so good. He's been in a lot of people's favorite movies. Like he was a voice in Emperor's New Groove, for God's sakes. Well, and he he makes he so really good. good choices when it comes he to does. films. You know, he really does. He's in good projects, and a lot of a lot of directors like to work with him. That's why he's in like every Coen Brothers movie, right? Oh That's yeah. And speaking of that. Uh, um, that bad guy wins ending, there were some things that were left here, right? Mm-hmm. So we still got that theologian, you know, Elsbeth, you know, um, Greta character yeah. who is keeping his nephew Sam. So presumably, I'm guessing that he either gets adopted by Greta or it gets put into the system or something. And that demon's out there and it knows about Greta and it's probably going to be looking for her. I would say. And so the there's target. a huge sequel here ready to ready to happen because she, it is alluded, is really the hero. She's in, the, in point of fact that she's been preparing herself for 
for this confrontation her whole life since her father was killed by this thing. And so I think that's what this movie is almost a preamble to. And I'd love to see that movie. And that's what I thought toward the end of the movie when that cat is walking off into the woods. I was like, okay, well, what about Greta? And what about his nephew? Are we just going to leave that by the wayside and just assume that everything's okay, right? It seems like they were setting it up for a sequel, right? It was it was going to be in the works at some point. I don't obviously. think it occurred to me at the time, honestly. It's just now that I think, you know, it's like you could have this duo with this grown-up kid that wants revenge for his dad and for his uncle. And you have this woman who's been preparing for this all her life and for the murder of her father by this demon. And who has so much knowledge and about she, it. Yeah, exactly. If anyone's going to defeat it, it would be her. And it could be right? super interesting and it would be really good for this, for the times now when we're trying to, you know, have so many more female heroines more realistically, you know? So I think well, that'd be a cool movie to have. And, and I think we're going to actually discuss our sequel ideas on Patreon. So head over there and we'll be dropping our sequel ideas for Fallen soon. Yes. Well, here at the Film Flamers, we like to ask a series of questions about all the movies that we cover. The first one is always, is Fallen a horror movie? Yeah, yeah, t- totally. And I think that we've talked about the adjacency uh, before, obviously, with mm-hmm. Silence of the Lambs and Copycat and Seven. And this one, I think, is even less... Uh, adjacent and more firmly in the horror camp just because of the supernatural element at least the colloquial understanding of what horror is i know that i've we've read a couple of places where oh horror is well i think someone like big in the critic community or someone described horror as supernatural Mm -hmm. it's not horror if it's not supernatural yeah right and i think that's bullshit but at the same time i think it does in this case firmly planted in horror territory. Well, for a film critic to say something like that is completely ridiculous. I mean, you would think that somebody who makes their living from watching movies and has seen many movies would know for a fact that not every horror movie is going to have to have some sort of supernatural element to it, because that's just not the case, right? This one does. I mean, this is squarely a possession movie, something that we see in horror time and time again, uh, maybe less frequently than things like slashers or... And it almost is a slasher compared to relatively speaking to like silence of the lambs or seven or copycat, maybe a little less from copycat because copycats also has a slasher element, right. but this has that, you know, you don't know where it is and it could be around the corner and try and kill you at any moment. And there's much more horrific kind of quality to that versus like seven or silence of the lambs. Most of it's procedural. Most of it's kind of intriguing as far as following the crime and the, the horrific quality of the crimes, the things that have already happened, right. Versus this, is what's going to happen next what crosshairs am i going to be in what danger am i in and there's a very real and specific horror to this possession the style of possession that we haven't seen in film before or since i don't think and that's what i think makes it a horror movie is the is the possession stuff i mean we it is kind of slasher you know in a way and like we've already talked about some of these 90s crime movies being slashers but just like the rest of them there's hardly any actual violence on screen. Yeah, I think there's like a body count of the seven or eight. Yeah, but film. we only get to see the bodies, right? Yeah. There's really no murder going on. We don't. We ever see the after effects of all of it. And mm-hmm. then, sort of. You you do see him uh, and his host bodies attacking with his syringes and knives and stuff. Some of the you know the string of murder, copycat murders. You see some of those happen. I just only remember the bodies being in the bathtubs. The yeah, showing up after the fact. It did know? show at least one of them being. I mean, I him. know that they found the syringes and things. like that. He knocks that. at the door, and then the guy answers it, and he stabs him in the chest or whatever, and then he makes a cereal. And <laughs> well, they oh, that's right. Yeah. Well, they, they could have amped that violence up a little bit, you know, to sort of create a more gory scare, a more gory horror feeling. Right? I do have to but say, I was just... more, I was more scared watching this film, especially on the initial watch years and years ago. Well, you're jumping the gun on my next question, Chris. Oh, shit. Sorry. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> my apology. So were you scared watching Fallen? Yeah. Initially, I was really scared. I think uh, it was just really creepy. And it's, uh, it's that fear of the unknown, right? There's just a, a really like mysterious kind of unknowable you know, horror here, which is uh, like cosmic supernatural horror. That's really, really interesting. And um, you can't quite, you know, put your finger on what is so scary about it. But I think it's, you know, you could, you could put your finger on obviously the, the actual physical process of being possessed and everything else. But it's also just like the nature of evil itself and humanity. And all of that is, is horrifying because it's almost ex- ex- existential in a way. 
Now, I found myself a lot, a lot more scared watching Sons of the Lambs or Seven, right? I wasn't quite as terrified watching this movie. I was on the edge of my seat, especially during those scenes where he was transferring bodies as quickly as possible. Right? I would say those are equally as scary in their moments, right? But there was more opportunity for those moments in this film because for almost the entire movie, this thing is on the loose and everything, right? She, in Silence of the Lambs, she's not really in the presence of in, of danger until the very end, right? Right. And so, I mean, I, that's why earlier I said I'd like to have seen more of this, like, you know, transference of possession. You know, I think it would have made the movie a lot scarier. And, you know, they didn't have to have so much of a backstory for everything, which, you know, made me a little less scared. Right. Yeah. They kept trying to tell me too much why instead of just showing it to me. Right. Yeah. So, I mean... I, I'm always scared watching horror movies a little bit, right? And this was no exception. I just wish that I was a little bit more scared watching it. I don't want a tangent, but were you ever scared of Hannibal? No. No. The like, sequel? No. That's, what's, that's oh, just, not the movie, the character. No, the character. Like, I, I was never afraid of no. Hannibal because you're almost rooting for him. Yeah, he's in a, a way. hero in that movie. Right? Yeah, so, definitely an antihero. And so that was very unique. I'm not so, scared of Hannibal, but I'm scared of Hannibal's actions. Right. So, I mean, that scene where he's, you know, killing those cops, right, in his little jail cell. I mean, like that scared me, especially when I was younger watching it. Oh, sure. And finally, who's the hottest guy in Fallen? I would have to say Denzel or Elias Codius. Um, Denzel is much more of the Gregory Peckish kind of character in this film. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I liked about him was that there wasn't a long drawn out process of him having to like finally come to terms with what's actually happening. He has one WTF moment and then he just gets it. He falls in lines. He recognizes the facts and he just, he just goes with it because it's exactly, you know what everything's pointing to. And so he logically goes where, the facts are pointing him, yeah. which is this supernatural thing. And I love that part of this movie that it does show him, you've got to be kidding me. And then he just kind of has that moment of realization right after that. He thinks it through and he's there. And that's what a good detective is. I mean, they follow the clues to the end, no matter what the outcome is, supernatural or not. Yeah. When I was watching this and texting Chris within that first three minutes, also I said, is it really bad that I think that Elias Codius is really hot in this movie? Because he's super fucking crazy, like right from the get-go. And like we walk in, we see his ass because he's taking a piss in that cell. And I was just like, okay, yeah, he's pretty hot. But watching this movie, I was reminded at how attractive Denzel Washington just really is. He has got like the perfect like movie star kind of classic handsome quality about him. Yeah, and it's his, his physicality and his voice and yeah, you know, I mean, the way he dreamy. speaks and everything. He's very dreamy. Yeah. So I'm gonna have to go with Denzel Washington for this one for sure. Well, guys, we want to know what you think about Fallen. Like I said, this was my first watch, and I'm still trying to place my emotions on, you know, how I feel about it. I'm going to give it a second watch because I like to do that anyway and, you know, sort of, you know, decide full on exactly how I feel about it. But we're always curious to know what you listeners feel as well. Yeah. I'm a big fan of this film. I don't think it's the the greatest movie on earth, that's for sure. Uh, But it's certainly not the worst, and I don't think it's as derivative as people think it is. No. Especially given the the time that's passed. And I definitely would recommend a watch. It's definitely worth seeing. Yeah, if you're hesitant based on, like, you know, critical response or things like that, don't. Just go watch the movie, because what we've already talked about, it's got a much higher audience score. Exactly. people like it. Mm -hmm. So you can let us know what you think about Fallen on social media, at The Film Flamers, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can email us at tiredqueens at filmflamers.com or you can call us on our hotline at 972-666-7733 and let your voice be heard. That's right. If you call and leave us a voicemail, either about Fallen or anything you want to talk about Film Flamers wise, we'll play that voicemail on our Shooting the Flames episode at the start of every month. And if you really appreciate the Film Flamers and what we're trying to do here... Please don't hesitate to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. It really warms our cold hearts whenever we see those pop up. So, And we will read those reviews on our Shooting the Flames episodes every month. So please don't hesitate to do that. It really helps us out, and we really appreciate them. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our September content this month, and we still have one more episode coming at you next week. We're going to do a very special top ten involving a theme from the movie Fallen, so stay tuned for that. Also, check out our Patreon, where we're talking again about our sequel ideas for Fallen, and we're going to be doing another Flamers flashback this month, this time having to do with another time, another place, 
in the Age of Wonder. <laughs> the Dark Crystal. <laughs> The Great Conjunction. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Conjunction as it had. <laughs> yes, guys, go over to patreon.com slash the film flamers for all of that content. You can get that bonus content and early access to our episodes. And finally, October's coming up and we have a lot of stuff planned. But especially one of my favorite horror movies we'll be covering is Creep Show. And possibly get into the other creep show movies, maybe creep show two. Yeah, we'll see how we feel. So, well, I don't know about you, Robert, but I keep on falling. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a tired queen. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, until the next episode, before Chris falls. Sweet, sweet dreams. dreams. Ta-da. Is on my side. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that song stuck in my head anymore. Come on. <laughs> <laughs>